Hi everyone and welcome to today's event, What's Happening in Iran? My name is Sam. I'm a member of the Tempest Collective and of internationalism from below. Today's event was motivated by the recent wave of protests and strikes across Iran, particularly in the south, in Khuzestan province. We will talk about class and labor politics, the feminist movement, the struggles of national minorities such as Kurds, Arabs and Afghans, the counter-revolutionary nature of the Islamic regime and how socialists should make sense of these recent developments. This meeting is sponsored by Haymarket Books, New Politics Magazine and Internationalism from Below, a network of socialist activists that seeks to build transnational solidarity among social movements and popular struggles for social justice and democracy. This forum is part of our new What's Happening series that was launched last week with our forum on the recent protest in Cuba, the video of which is available in the Haymarket YouTube channel. Upcoming events in the series will focus on the unfolding situation in Afghanistan, Myanmar and South Africa, and the elections in Germany. For details on these events, please follow internationalism from below on Facebook and Twitter. You can find the information in the chat. We have three speakers today, Kaveh Sani, Frida Fari, and Danny Postel. Kava is the Associate Professor of International Studies at DePaul University in Chicago. His books include Social History of Oil in Iran in Persian and Working for Oil, Comparative Social Histories of Labor in the Global Oil Industry. He has worked as a regional planner at the World Bank and UNDP as a development planner in Iran. He worked on water resources, planning, drought, urban governance, and post-war reconstruction in Khuzestan province. He is a member of the board of directors of the Middle East Research and Information Project, and is a contributing editor of the journals Goftegu, based in Tehran, Middle East Report, and Iranian Studies. You can find his recent articles in Jacobin called The Moral Economy of the Iranian Protest. Kava will contextualize the recent protests in their historical and geographical specificity. Um, our second speaker will be Frida Afari, who is an Iranian-American librarian, translator, and activist. She produces the blog Iranian Progressives in Translation and writes about the Middle East and the politics of solidarity for a variety of publications, including the New Politics magazine. Her essay, The Iranian Uprising of 2019-20, appeared in the recent book A Region in Revolt, Mapping the Recent Uprisings in North Africa and West Asia, edited by Jed Saab and published by Daraja Press. Um, you can find her latest article on new politics called Iran, a new wave of mass protests and strikes. Frida will talk about the feminist movement and the struggles of national minorities. Our third speaker, Danny Postel, is ass assistant director of the Center for International and Area Studies at Northwestern University and a member of internationalism from below. He is co-editor of The People Reloaded, the Green Movement and the Struggle for Iran's Future, the Syria Dilemma, the Sectarianization Mapping the New Politics of the Middle East. Formerly senior editor of Open Democracy magazine, he has written for Boston Review, the Carroll Review of Global Affairs, Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, Democratic Left, Dissent, The Guardian, In These Times, Middle East Report, The Nation, New Politics, Tehran Bureau, and The Progressive, among other publications. His latest article, published in New Politics, called The Other Regional Counter-Revolution, Iran's Role in the Shifting Political Landscape of the Middle East. Daniel will talk about the counter-revolutionary nature of the Islamic regime and the reasons for the persistence of the myth of the axis of resistance. All right. We will start today's meeting with, uh, with Kave and welcome and we welcome the uh, and invite the audience to post their questions in the chat. Okay, Kava, I would like to um, ask you about the the recent protests, particularly as as they manifested in Khuzestan in protest to a lack of uh, access to water, and how they were repressed by the regime. Um, how do we make sense of these process? What is uh, of these protests? What is their geographical and historical context? Yeah, thank you, Sam, and um, thank you, Haymarket Books. It's a it's a pleasure, and honor to to you know to participate in this conversation. Um, the since you 
specifically asked about the recent protests, um, I need to emphasize the fact that um, public protests are have been at least uh, since 1979 um, part of the political repertoire of um, of social expression in in Iran. There's uh, you know and on any day when you look at the news on a national level, um, you have uh, you have a panoply of protests, public protests taking place across the country, you know, so these are often, uh, you know, labor protests by different professions, nurses, bus drivers, um, uh, agrarian workers, you know, oil workers, teachers, and so on and so forth. Or you have protests and, uh, you know, public demonstrations by students or, you know, any number of other groups. Uh, minorities, they often, these protests often happen uh, in smaller towns, uh, you know, in, in provincial towns, provincial capitals, they're not just necessarily focused and concentrated in large cities. Uh, so this is in some ways similar to France and maybe because of the same shared history of social revolutions. Um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, this kind of like the, the, the willingness to risk and not being afraid of uh, sheer physical repression has become part of everyday political culture in, in, in Iran. It has been, you know, it has been there. Um, so, you know, it, it's important not to kind of think just because they're public protests, that means that there is a revolution and regime change, uh, you know, around the corner. This is a little bit um, of kind of like, you know, uh, a wish factor among many people, especially foreign, you know, uh, commentators who suddenly take notice of what is taking place in, you know, in, in Iran and kind of assign to it uh, the kind of significance that it necessarily doesn't have. Although by, by no means do I mean that these protests are insignificant. They are quite significant. They show a population that is willing to claim um, the rights that it feels are being violated and is not necessarily afraid of repression in a way that maybe other societies that haven't had the same kind of history, uh, maybe. So having said this, uh, the recent protests in Khuzestan came in several waves. I mean, they started, and I think Sam, you, I saw that you had written about this. They started with labor protests uh, by oil workers and uh, by agrarian workers. And many of these protests have actually been long ongoing and often, you know, uh, kind of repressed. And I don't want to get into that at this point because, uh, you know, I want to get to the specific question that you asked. Uh, but these labor protests that began in May and June then escalated and expanded into outrage at uh, the, the, the shortfalls in public services, especially drinking water, uh, and electricity cuts. Now, the geography of the province, you know, Khuzestan is located in southwestern Iran. It's at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. It neighbors Iraq and the Persian Gulf. Um, so it's a maritime province. It holds the vast uh, majority of surface water in Iran. The largest Iranian rivers flow through this province. It's an extension of Mesopotamia. Uh, so the river Karun, which is Iran's largest river, flows into Tigris and Euphrates and forms Shat al Arab. As, uh, and there are several other major rivers um, that kind of flow in through, in, through this province, which is situated on a Piedmont of the Zagros Range, uh, which is quite a fertile and uh, you know uh, and, and and beautiful region, right? So a lot of this protest, rightly, came. At, you know, as a consequence of the fact that people who live in a land of river water suddenly did not have drinkable water available to them. And we're talking about large cities like Ahwaz that has upward of a million and a half population, major, you know, oil cities like, uh, you know, Abadan, port city of Khurramshah, you know, major cities suddenly began to kind of experience uh, you know, shortage of drinking and portable water because <clears throat> of various, you know, reasons, but um, 
and then you know uh, a lot of the electricity production <clears throat> is you know obviously is carried out through you know electricity generation is carried out through you know fossil fuels like everywhere else and Khuzestan is the epicenter of oil production and fossil fuel production in the country so the on the one hand the seeming appearance of plenty of resources to provide these basic services uh, suddenly juxtaposed to the fact that in a very hot and humid summer where temperatures were soaring over 120, uh, people suddenly began to really suffer for not having at least these very basic, uh, you know, services that they felt, uh, you know, were, were their right and had been there available, you know, prior to that. Now, you know, so pe people poured into the streets uh, in many, many different cities of the of the province, and uh, repression followed. Although, by all counts, uh, having talked to people, it was not on the same scale of repression as what happened with the protests of uh, two years ago, or three years ago, or four years ago. I mean, that you know, those were bloodbaths by comparison. So, you know, there was a little bit of a measured response. Uh, relatively speaking, but nonetheless repression. And this came right in the middle of uh, presidential and parliamentary elections, which really put to, to test the legitimacy of, you know, the Republican aspect of, of, of this regime. So what we have in Khuzestan is a, an environmental crisis, a social crisis, uh, and, and a political crisis, all kind of compiled into an overlapping into one major crisis that became quite symbolic of the state of the country at present. And I think, uh, you know, you mentioned that a lot of my work has been about Khuzestan, my writings. Um, and what, I've, what I find fascinating about Khuzestan is the fact that, uh, you know, in some ways this province is the epicenter or the model or the, like the, uh, you know, a laboratory of how modernization and nation building has taken place in Iran over the past 120 years. You know, not just not just recently, but over the past 120 years, because large scale, you know, agribusinesses were, you know, were carried out by the intervention of the World Bank and uh, American uh, development experts right after the Second World War during the 1950s at the height of the Cold War in this province, Iran and the province of Khuzestan was the first experiment by the US at the height of the Cold War after the 1953 coup d'etat to actually bring development from, based on an American model, the TVA model, the Tennessee Valley Authority model, and to modernize the population and the geography of this region. Building dams, building agribusinesses, you know, in, you know importing foreign capital and expertise the province was the epicenter of the oil industry. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the main sources of, you know, oil exports. Uh, and political upheavals like the 1950, you know, the 49, 53 oil nationalization movement and the coup d'etat, the revolution of 1979, the Iran-Iraq war, all of these events had their epicenter in this province. So in some ways, in a microcosm, we can see that, uh, you know, in this geography, in this limited provincial geography, which is very multi-ethnic, which has a very rich history, which is on the margin, but also at the center of what is happening on, in the nation, but also globally, you suddenly can capture and see all these crises and responses and forms of popular mobilization uh, that can tell us a lot about what is happening in in Iran at present, but also what is happening in the region and maybe even beyond that. Um, thank you, Kaveh.
we resolved our technical difficulty and Frida is back with us. Uh, Frida, I wanted to ask you about um, about the feminist movement in Iran. What is the what is the current state of women's rights struggles in Iran? And what are what are some of its mo main demands? And has it been part of the of the recent protest? And how does it relate to it? Yes, women have been part of the recent protests, uh, both in uh, Khuzestan um, and in general nationwide, uh, including uh, uh, involved in labor struggles and the struggles of the retirees and teachers and nurses. Um, in general, uh, I would like to say that women have been involved in social movements in Iran, major social movements in Iran since the beginning of the 20th century with the Iranian Constitutional Revolution and then with the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Uh, women were uh, actively involved in overthrowing the monarchy and then when the Islamic Republic um, came into power or right after the revolution when Khomeini announced the order uh, that made it compulsory to wear the hijab. They went out on International Women's Day and they said, we didn't make a revolution to go backward. That was one of their slogans. And unfortunately, at the time, the majority of the left, Iranian left, uh, discouraged them from doing that. Um, and then uh, because they said that they believed that Khomeini was an anti-imperialist power and they thought that the women shouldn't raise those demands at that point because U.S. imperialism was the main enemy. Um, then um, women were very involved in the Green Movement in 2009 against the, um, the um, fraudulent election of Ahmadinejad. They were very involved in the two December 2017 uprising, uh, which was the, main, the first major uh, uh, uprising that demanded the overthrow of the Islamic Republic and an end to its interventions in the region. In fact, the day before that uprising in December 2017 is when one woman got on a uh, uh, electrical post in Tehran and took off her her scarf and you know as a, a sign of opposition to the compulsory hijab. And they, women who did that, became known as Girls of Revolution Avenue. And uh, they were arrested by the regime for violating uh, um, um, uh, Islamic principles. And so that insurrection, that uh, mass uh, protest became very much intertwined with the demand of women for um, in opposition to the compulsory hijab. Um, then in 2019, there was another uh, uprising. Um, and uh, in, in November of 2019, in this case, women were really in the forefront of the protests. And um, we don't know how many women were arrested and killed. We know that 1,500 were killed and thousands were arrested. Um, and then uh, when uh, Qasem Soleimani was killed by the U.S. and there were at first, there were the Iranian government claimed that people were opposed, supported Qasem Soleimani, but then we started seeing another wave of protests in Tehran and other cities um, against uh, Qasem Soleimani and against Iran's downing of the uh, Ukrainian plane um, uh, that Iran downed in as as, as it was try, trying to take revenge against uh, Iran's uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, <coughs> um, murder of Qasem Soleimani. And we saw women in the forefront of that. Um, and then we, uh, so in general, it, in, in every wave of mass protests in Iran, women have been very involved. And most more recent struggles in Iran today is that, first of all, we have uh, women like Nasrina Sotudeh and Nargis Mohammadi, who are donors, who are feminists, like Zainab Jalalian. Uh, we have Sepida Qolian, who is a uh, journalist and labor activist, also a feminist, writing about the, the plight of Arab women in um, Khuzestan. 
And uh, we have a Me Too movement that is a uh, budding Me Too movement that is opposing gender violence and sexual violence. And so all of these demands are very important and new. Um, do, I, do I have more time to go on or do I need to stop at this point? No, oh, please continue. OK, so, um, so we do have, we definitely have a women's movement we have a women's movement that has um, some clear feminist demands. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge that and we have and we have quite a few women prisoners, uh, women political prisoners. But in addition to women, pris uh, women political prisoners, women, we have hundreds of women who are in prison because of uh, uh, defending themselves against abusive husbands or because the husband uh, was not able to pay his debts, and so the woman was put in prison instead of the man, uh, or because of drug charges, but often related to the man, but the woman ends up taking the blame for it. So um, on the one hand, we have the, uh, uh, this situation and this history. On the other hand, I wanted to acknowledge that the Iranian regime has been able to use sexism and misogyny as a very powerful tool uh, to stay in power. Uh, when uh, the Islamic Republic came into power in 1979, it, Khomeini used the anti-imperialist card. He uh, also uh, claimed that he was for social justice, that what he stood for was, was st uh, stood for social justice. But he also clearly used misogyny and sexism to, um, to gain support from a large portion of Iranian men, uh, including intellectual men who, who benefit from, um, from the oppression of women and from the rights that women lost with the Islamic Republic. Um, and he also appealed to a certain sector of traditional women uh, who uh, believed in those values but also, uh, interestingly, was what the the Islamist movement that Khomeini promoted was willing to uh, advance women who were able to and willing to help the regime. And so they weren't just pushing those women back into the home. They were saying, if you promote the regime, if you help us, we will advance you. We will give you benefits. So all of all of those factors need to be considered, uh, but we have to give a lot of credit to Iranian women for their resistance for the past 42 years, and they have resisted in so many ways. First of all, they took advantage of the fact that more women were able to enter universities, even though they're, of course, uh, sexually segregated, uh, gender segregated. Um, they took advantage of that. And so at this point, 60% of college graduates in Iran are, are women. They took advantage of every opportunity to write. So women started writing novels. They started publishing translations. They uh, started a million signature, a signatures campaign to, again, to defend their basic rights. As I mentioned, the right to divorce, the right to custody, the right to travel, the right to work. They are having fewer children, so the fertility rate in Iran is now 2.0, whereas in the 1980s it was about 6, uh, 6.0. And um, so, and then although women are, are, are only 15% of the formal labor market, they're very involved in working. It's just that their work doesn't count as part of the formal labor market. It's part of the informal labor market. Um, more and more women are living independently or I mean outside the parents home with roommates, especially in, in bigger cities. Uh, more women have sex outside of marriage, but at the same time, I, we can't say that we've had a full blown sexual revolution in Iran because unfortunately, in order to get married, virginity is still very important. And so um, some women resort to uh, a, a procedure called hy hymenoplasty uh, to, 
to pretend that you know they've never had sex before in order to be acceptable to the to the husband's family and 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 to the husband himself. Mm-hmm. But Sean, tell me what 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 I was saying. So. I Apologies, everyone. There were uh, technical difficulties, and we unfortunately uh, lost part of uh, uh, Frieda's talk. But we'll move on to Danny, and we'll come back uh, to to Frieda and Kobe to hear back about national minorities and the labor struggle. Um, so, Danny, let's zoom out and talk about the role of Iran in the region. Why do you think this role is counter-revolutionary as opposed to a revolutionary one? Right. So the conventional wisdom or the dominant narrative for several decades now has been that Iran is a revolutionary actor in the vanguard of a regional axis of resistance in the Middle East, opposing U.S. imperialism and its allies. Right. Um, and this view is not only um, projected by the Islamic Republic itself. In fact, it's really central to Tehran's um, narrative about its and its very identity uh, as a regime. But this view is also widely shared uh, in, in, in the West amongst people of very different ideological persuasion. So for example, you have neocons and so-called Iran hawks on the right um, and people in certain quarters of the left and in anti-war and anti-imperialist circles who subscribe to this view. They agree that Iran is a revolutionary state and leads an axis of resistance. They just disagree about whether that's a good thing or not. So for neocons and hawks in Washington, you know, Iran's so-called revolutionary um, behavior in the region is something that has to be confronted, contained, or stopped altogether. Whereas <clears throat> for leftists, um, you know, people in certain anti-war and anti-imperialist circles, uh, Iran's revol so-called revolutionary leadership of this axis of resistance is a good thing. So they disagree about um, about the policies, but they agree that, that 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 Iran is a revolutionary state. And what I what I'm trying to do in my most recent article that you mentioned earlier is to show that in fact, um, over the last 15 to 20 years, what we see particularly in three key theaters of contestation in the Middle East, namely Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, what you see happening is that Iran is increasingly playing a counter-revolutionary role, propping up um, existing regimes and supporting status, the status quo in these three places. 
and and doing um, all sorts of things to undermine and destroy uh, resistance movements, popular mobilizations, um, and protest movements. So, you know, just briefly, um, it, with Syria, you know, the, the the general idea that Iran has gone uh, done a lot to 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 project um, is that Iran is playing is is basically involved in Syria to stop extremists, to fight um, jihadis and terrorists. It's a kind of war on terror narrative, right? And so um, Iran is particularly, Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister, is particularly good at articulating this view um, in Western circles and in media interviews where he talks about Iran, you know, fighting Al-Qaeda, fighting ISIS. Well, the problem with this view is that it it's a, a classic example of reading history backwards. If you look at how Iran first intervened in Syria at the beginning of the uh, Syrian uprising in March of 2011 and through those first six, seven months of the of the uprising, there was no Al-Qaeda, there was no ISIS. Um, the only jihadis on the scene were the ones Assad let, let out of his own prisons. And so what was Iran actually up to? It was actually up to siding with um, a murderous, repressive regime, um, a, a dynastic dictatorship that had been in power for 40 years at that point, 50 years now, as it was opening fire, li opening live ammunition on uh, unarmed protesters who were demanding the same things that their counterparts in Tunisia and Egypt were demanding an end to dictatorship, democratic rights, social justice, dignity. Um, so that it's very important to remember that the first phase of the Syrian uprising was in fact uh, almost in entirely nonviolent and was making these broadly um, emancipatory demands. And Iran was on the side, not of the protesters, but on the side of the dictatorship that was shooting them and jailing them and torturing them. Now in Iraq, uh, you have an interesting case where, you know, this goes back even further to 2003, 2004, 2005. Iraq and the United States, I'm sorry, Iran and the United States uh, are, are essentially on the same side of the Iraqi, uh, the new Iraqi equation. They helped build the new post-Saddam Iraq um, after the 2003 U.S. invasion and occupation. And, and Iran is actually uh, the number one regional ally of, of this new Iraqi regime. And in October 2019, you had the biggest grassroots socio-political mobilization in Iraq's history, as one uh, scholar noted. The Iraqi feminist sociologist Zahra Ali argues that at root that mobilization was about the poor, the disempowered, and the marginalized demanding a new system. Iran is very has played a very directly counter-revolutionary role in that uprising, helping the Iraqi state crush these demonstrations um, across uh, Iraq's uh, cities and regions. And, and in fact, it's important to note that those up that those protests, really the, the the nerve center of that movement, was in uh, the Shia heartland uh, of Iraq south in Basra. Um, and in Lebanon, you had another mass uprising that took place at the exact same time, starting in October 2019, sometimes called the October Revolution, where people were rebelling against what, what the Lebanese political scientist Basel Salouh calls the socio-economic violence produced by the sectarian order with its rampant clientelism and corruption. And uh, the Lebanese leftist sociologist Rima Majid calls the October 2019 uprising a revolt against sectarian neoliberalism. So where does Iran figure in that story? Well, not, not as directly as it does in Iraq, but its, its closest ally in Lebanon, which is Hezbollah, came out against these protests and in fact sent mobs to beat protesters, burn uh, their tents and, and, and destroy the main encampment in Beirut of, of this uh, uprising. And Iran and, and Khamenei issued statements saying that this this uprising threatened uh, regional order and threatened to uh, to to unleash chaos, and 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 uh, indulged in these sort of conspiracy theories that this was foreign inspired, and a plot against the Lebanese state. The point is that this was an uprising against the status quo in Lebanon, 
Hezbollah is very much part of the status quo. It is part of the ruling elite in Lebanon. And Iran sided with that status quo, with that ruling system in Lebanon against this popular emancipatory mobilization. So these, in these three cases of Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, Iran has consistently sided with ruling elites, um, established regimes, and engaged in, in either directly or indirectly in massive, massive repression, um, shooting unarmed demonstrators and, um, and jailing them. And in the case of Iraq, there's a huge assassination campaign against Iraqi activists that continues to this day, and Iran has its fingerprints all over this. Um, so, so I'm trying to paint a very different picture of what's actually been going on in the Middle East over the last 17 to 20 years, and to suggest that the dominant narrative, this sort of conventional wisdom that Iran is a revolutionary state in the vanguard of a regional axis of resistance, needs a, a very serious rethink. Um, I quote the sociologist uh, Ulrich Beck, who talks about zombie categories, right, which are these categories that may have described the world at one point, but stopped doing so. And yet they continue to live on and blind us to the world around us. And I think that this, this language, this category of Iran as a revolutionary state leading a regional axis of resistance is precisely such a zombie category that we need to discard at this point and see that what you have is con competing regional counter-revolutions, one led by Saudi Arabia in its sphere of influence, one led by Iran in its sphere of influence. Saudi Arabia and Iran are regional rivals, but they are in fact both engaged in counter-revolutionary agendas that compete with one another, but they are, um, we, 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 there's a tendency to allow the Saudi-Iranian rivalry to blind us to the fact that they're actually both engaged for all of their differences and this war of position that they're in. There's a certain confluence between their counter-revolutionary agendas, although in separate spheres of influence in the region. Um, thank you, Danny. And if there is time, I would like to come back and ask you a question which I had. And interestingly, someone in the chat put a very similar question that considering these examples you laid out, why this myth persists that Iran has a revolutionary character. But before doing so, first, I want to encourage um, audience to put their questions in the chat for us to to raise them. And um, Kava, I would like to return to the question of, of Khuzestan and protests in Iran, but this time look more at the, the labor angle of the protests. Um, so in 19th of June, there was this um, mass strike that began by oil and gas workers, particularly by welders and cutters, a decentralized uh, strike across uh, tens, if not hundreds of plants by thousands of workers. Um, how does this relate to the protests, but also, if I understood you correctly, to this really what seemed to me, and here I could be wrong, that failure of this modernization project of, of which the Khuzestan is example. And if that project has, so, and sort of my second question here is that if that project has failed and the Iranian regime is faced on the one hand with these protests and on the other hand with these mass labor strikes, what can be their response? What can the regime actually do to address these grievances? Thank you. Oh, you're muted, Kava. One forgets. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a very good question. Um, you know, in the heels of um, what uh, interesting discussion that Frida and Danny uh, had. Um, let me say, you know, let me, let me unpack this a little bit and say that um, we kind of, we need to look at the, 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 the history of the past at least 40 years of the post-revolution Iran as a process. I mean, the Iranian, you know, we, we talk about uh, the Iranian regime, you know, the Islamic Republic, um, Iranian society, uh, sometimes maybe with the sense that they're kind of like solid categories that haven't changed over time. Uh, whereas in fact, I think, uh, you know, we're dealing with a society 
institutions and subjects and a state that has been constantly undergoing transformation, uh, both internally, but also in terms of all those things that uh, uh, that Danny was, uh, you know, mentioning. So the impetus for the Iranian revolution, and I've written about this, you know, before is, you know, I, I don't call the Islamic, I, I don't call the Iranian revolution of 1979 an Islamic revolution. I call it the provincial revolution. Because I think it it had exactly, it was exactly rooted in this um, moral claim of the vast majority of the population to actually kind of gain a voice uh, in the political domain and in power relations and in the way that their society was being run. Uh, and they quite su spectacularly succeeded in this. And this has kind of like become a, you know, it became a turning point and it has kind of shaped political culture in Iran, both at the governmental level among the political elite, but also among the masses of the ordinary people at various levels. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean, you know, you kind of, you had um, the pre-revolution Iran was a society which was, which was quite poor, you know, at the turn of 20th century, but because of changes and developments and oil revenues and all that, and it wasn't just oil revenues, but an economy that was gradually built over time, uh, created, generated quite a bit of wealth that accumulated increasingly in the hands of very few people in large cities and in poles of development, in centers that became quite affluent visually. Uh, and you know, surrounded by, you know, like large regions of people who felt, you know, who could see what was taking place, but felt completely disenfranchised. And in the 1960s Iran, you know, a major land reform took place. It was actually a major social revolution because the, from top down, uh, the central government, the monarchy, uh, basically dispossessed the entire landowning class the vast majority of them, not the entire, but the vast majority of them, and created a, you know, a, an enormous class of small scale farmers and displaced rural populations. And this really kind of precipitated a social transformation that kind of eventually led to the, to the revolution by people who were migrants, but people who became dispossessed peasants and so on and so forth. And the, the Islamic regime or the post-revolutionary regime was kind of made organically by, you know, like this large number of people who kind of engaged in the protests that led to the revolution, but also gained a foothold, uh, gained political influence, gained positions in the post-revolutionary regime. And the change that has been taking place since 1979 has been an ongoing process, right? So if in the 1980s, for example, in the province of Khuzestan, uh, you know, the, the whole province was marked by first a revolution where the oil workers in 1979 successfully for the first time in a third world country managed to shut off oil production, uh, crippled the monarchy, uh, really precipitated and, you know, brought about the, you know, the, the eventual downfall of the regime. Uh, and mobilized to kind of restart production uh, and nationalize the entire oil oil industry on their own, and very soon were scuttled by the Iraqi invasion and the, the eight-year-long Iran-Iraq war. So the province of Khuzestan, and especially its oil workers, uh, gained this notoriety for being, you know, the, the bulwark of the post-revolutionary regime, not because necessarily oil workers were Khomeinis or were supporters of the regime. They were nationalists, many of them were Marxists, many of them were kind of leftists, or they supported the revolution without being necessarily ideological one way or another. That's a different question. But they, they gained this kind of mythical position of having been the Pole and the, the, the bulwark of resistance during the war, you know, keeping the oil refinery, keeping oil production going, even though they were under bombardment, they were on the border, and, you know, making sure that the entire system, the post-revolutionary order, survived, right? So they came out in 1988 with a huge, um, you know, political and symbolic capital of 
having been you know the you know the major supporters of you know of of you know and and guaranteeing the survival of the regime for better or for worse and very soon in the 1990s as the new liberal no liberal order uh, of you know like reconstruction began to uh, take a much more no liberal order the moral claims that oil workers and other workers had 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 during the revolution and in the 1980s to you know establish a more just society to gain a share share of production to have a greater political voice to have the right to kind of self organize to self represent to have autonomy all of that was taken away under the dual impact of you know economic penury during the war uh, of the priority of you know national survival in wartime um, and during you know and and as a result of the political repression that accompanied the consolidated consolidation of the Khomeini's regime right so by 1990s the same workers the same laborers who in the agrarian sector in the industrial sector in the oil sector in the refinery sector in the ports and transportation had so much political capital gradually began to lose it quite spectacularly as labor laws and the labor regime began to be kind of gutted uh, increasingly in the name of economic rationality and the fact that we need to rebuild this war torn and uh, you know bankrupt um, economy and this language of economism which had become common sense under the you know hegemony of the you know washington consensus and and the world bank and all that really took root and was islamicized by the reformists by primarily by Rafsanjani who was president at that time and then his successor Khatami who were kind of relatively liberalizing the political sphere but at the same time really gutting and undermining any kind of moral claims by labor and ordinary working people uh, to basically control control their workplace and to kind of bring about more just distribution not necessarily economic transformation or you know like nationalization or you know any kind of socialist program but a redistributive paternalistic you know welfare state that had been effectively established for better or for worse during the during the 1980s so what we're seeing now is that you know on the one hand you have you know the, an economy that is under sanctions international sanctions and effectively bankrupt and is conducting those outside wars that uh, and interventions that Danny was mentioning it is increasingly losing legitimacy at home so the republican or electoral aspects of it that gave it some legitimacy because elections in iran did matter for better or for worse i mean uh, you know they did not explain the entire political system but they were quite significant in terms of how people felt they could still have a voice in the parliament in local elections you know in 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 presidency and uh, you know on a national level and in passing laws and all that right this you know this aspect the republican aspect of the you know of this regime was not insignificant but by now it has become relatively insignificant because this last elections that we had were the least amount of participation the most repressed the most censored in the history of the Islamic Republic, uh, basically excluding any alternative voices that uh, that that existed. The economy is entirely bankrupt um, as a combination of mismanagement, corruption, and international sanctions. And at the same time, what we're seeing is that despite all the repression, the working class, industrial working class, uh, agrarian working class, uh, have continued to resist and mobilize. And their mobilization has kind of, you know, and this is really important with these spectacular moments of uh, popular protests and labor protests in Iran. That they suddenly, you know, as long as these protests are constantly taking place in atomistic, separate, uh, you know, segregated, isolated instances. Okay, you take the ringleaders, you put them in prison, you, you know, you kind of uh, you take their voice away and all that and. Uh, you know, maybe things will die down. They never die down. But sometimes, when you these crises overlap, suddenly you get these networks of protests uh, with workers. With and in the case of oil workers, for example, um, you know, like permanent workers, but also casualized workers. Uh, you know, temporary workers, and you know, all these other workers that have been employed in an increasingly privatized oil sector 
suddenly coalescing in solidarity, uh, trying to gain, you know, to kind of change the labor laws, but also claim to back pay and working conditions and the corruption of this kind of privatization that has been going on. And that kind of really has inflamed the imaginary of not just isolated workers in their workplace, but their families, the urban neighborhoods, the, the region, and also kind of has caught on with protests against environmental, urban, uh, you know, political uh, situations. This is the interesting thing about the Iranian pol policy, po politics and polity, that this is a vibrant political society. Regardless of how repressed it is, we cannot simply, under we cannot reduce the understanding of the dynamics of Iranian politics to the state versus society. Because this is a fragmented state, which has a lot of contradictions within it. There's a lot of people working in the state that are quite sympathetic because of their living conditions, but also because of the, you know, the, the moral claims of protesters that really sympathize with the general population. School teachers, you know, rank and file soldiers, bureaucrats, technocrats, right? I mean, they don't necessarily go along with what the political elite are kind of thinking. And then you have popular protests taking place that are localized or provincial, but suddenly kind of become really enmeshed and network with things that are taking place elsewhere in the country. So with regard to the protests in Khuzestan, for example, the most fascinating thing was that every other province in the country began to, people began to come out and in solidarity with people of Khuzestan who were protesting against lack of water, drinking water, electricity, working conditions, labor, they began, they came out in Northwest, in Azerbaijan, in Mashhad, in the conservative religious city of Mashhad, in Tehran, in elsewhere, they came out in solidarity. So you do get the sense that, all right, there's a different kind of imaginary coming forth that is making these claims against, you know, the forms of development policies, the, the, the range of corruption, the foreign policies that this you know, ruling regime has been implementing and are being questioned and not accepted at all by the general public, uh, by women, uh, you know, activists, but also rank and file ordinary people who are not necessarily political, but have a moral claim to, you know, to the society that they live in because they don't feel like they're, you know, they, you know, they, they don't feel silence is an, you know, is, a, is an option. And they're not scared of, you know, police batons or repression. I mean, nobody wants that. But on the other hand, the political culture is not a terrorized political culture. And this is what is really hopeful in Iranian politics, I think. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I agree. It's very hope hopeful. And I was struck really by the level of solidarity amongst workers and how, how they really identify with each other's pain. But there really is a question of to what extent this solidarity um, transcends ethnic divides in the country. And that's where I'd like to turn to Frida. Um, what do you think, Frida? Has, has, have the recent protests been able to transcend that divide? Or what is the state of, of the struggles of national minorities? You know, we know that Khuzestan is particularly an Arab region. And um, what did that have to do with the struggles, if anything? You're muted, Frida. Thank you. That's a very good way of posing the question, because uh, as uh, Kava pointed out, the uh, protests, the recent wave of protests, uh, have definitely fired up the imaginary. And the fact that we have the intertwining of labor and uh, struggles against uh, discrimination against the uh, ethnic Arab population is, is very, very important. Um, and the fact that within Khuzestan, uh, the, the, uh, there, is a, there has been a vibrant uh, civil, civil rights uh, struggle and human rights struggle that is not limiting itself to um, the uh, ethnic Arab uh, population, but really as, as, as a universal uh, view of, of human rights as well. So, um, but I wouldn't, unfortunately, I think the issue of uh, 
div ethnic divisions is still quite uh, serious and, and very uh, real. Uh, so, for, so in general, Iranian society is very ethnically diverse, population of over 82 million, and uh, we have um, um, the, the main uh, national minority groups, or uh, uh, some of them wouldn't like even to be called ethnic minority. They prefer the term national minority. Um, they are uh, uh, Arab, uh, Kurdish, Azari, uh, Baluchi, and um, um, uh, Turkmen. And I hope I didn't miss anyone. I mean, there are others, but these were the, uh, the largest ones. And uh, there, we also have religious, uh, oppressed religious minorities. I mean, we have the Baha'i, Baha'i is an offshoot of this, uh, Shia Islam. And in Iran, Baha'is have no civil rights. They're not even allowed to attend school. They have no recognition. We have discrimination against Sufi Muslims. Uh, but going back to the issue of national minorities, um, so although not all um, national minorities uh, face the same level of discrimination, um, most of them, for instance, the Azeris have had qu a pretty good participation in leadership in, in the country historically. Uh, but in general, national minorities face um, economic discrimination, socially, educationally, they're disadvantaged, uh, environmentally, they're disadvantaged, um, and they're, they, they feel that their resources, um, not to feel, but in actuality is that uh, their resources are taken away from them. And then Kaveh, I'm sure, talked about this in the beginning when he was talking about Khuzestan. Unfortunately, I missed part of Kaveh because of my technical issues. Um, and of course, there's the issue of repression by the government uh, and the uh, refusal of the government to allow ethnic minorities uh, to um, promote their own culture, uh, their language. Um, there is a real desire to, for instance, on the part of national minorities to have their language, mother tongue as the language, language of instruction and language of administration in the region. And, and, and the, uh, the government opposes, the Iranian government opposes that. There are also a lot of political prisoners who are uh, national minorities, Arab, uh, Kurdish especially. Um, so, um, so there is, there, there is a desire among um, national minority activists for a post-Islamic Republic Iran that is going to be either a form of federalism or, or confederalism. And there are different ideas about this. For instance, um, federalism can be uh, ethnic federalism, so federalism based on, uh, on, on ethnic identity or national, uh, uh, national minority, the, with particular national minorities identity. Or uh, it could be geographical federalism, like the United States, different states, but not specifically identifying them as a, as a specific ethnicity. And then some advocate um, confederalism. Uh, then they use the model of the Rojava in uh, northern Syria uh, as, as a form of local self-government with a regional effort. Um, so those are some of the ideas that have been posed, and uh, there are also uh, there are also uh, the, the main the main reason for advocacy of federalism on the part of a lot of um, activists who are part of the national minorities in Iran is that they think that this would be a very a uh, reasonable way of giving them access to re regional resources and uh, uh, divide, uh, proposing laws and having more uh, freedom and more self-control. Uh, now, there are also some critiques of, of, um, of, of these, um, these ideas. For instance, um, one of the critiques of the, of the federalist uh, uh, alternative is that if it's an ethnic federalism, let's say you say this state is Kurdistan and this state is Azerbaijan only, um, then what about the states in which there is, uh, for instance, in Azerbaijan, there is also a, a substantial Kurdish population. 
And so the question that's posed is, um, so are they going to agree on having Azari as the language of instruction administration or Kurdish? Or how will they come to an agreement on that? If it's a if it's an ethnic federalist model uh, concerning confederalism, there is a critique that well we don't really know if the Rojava experience worked. But secondly, that the Rojava experience wasn't really the uh, the um, was more of a top down approach, and uh, it did make accomplishments in terms of secularism and and uh, some accomplishments in terms of secularism and women's rights. But um, there's some argument that it was more of a party politics from the top down, and so that cannot be used as an example. There are some who refer to the example of the uh, the Kurdish autonomous region of, of Iraq, and um, and how corrupt the, the the regime is there, and how it's colluding with various powers in the region. So there are a lot of um, criticisms. Um, I, I personally, I am very much in favor of having further discussion on these issues, and I don't really see us having um, being able to get out of the Islamic Republic without a real serious alternative that uh, accounts for um, the rights of ethnic and national minorities and religious oppressed religious minorities. And uh, uh, one more point that I wanted to make is. Um, um, yeah, so that Iran definitely needs to confront the oppression of national and ethnic minorities. The question of, of different religion, uh, different languages and cultures being able to promote themselves is very important. And so um, how will we do that? That needs a lot further discussion. And then um, I also wanted to mention since we're talking about um, uh, oppressed minorities, the Afghan uh, refugee and a migrant population in Iran, uh, that is definitely an oppressed minority. Uh, there are currently 2 to 2.5 million Afghan migrants and refugees in Iran, and of over 1.5 million of them are undocumented. And so whether they're documented or undocumented, they're severely discriminated against. Uh, Afghan refugees and migrants, they do a lot of the manual work, a lot of the unskilled work. Uh, they, um, they, you know, they, they, uh, they get very little pay. They face a lot of discrimination. They do a lot of the construction work. And um, also the records show that when it comes to education, here I'm looking at a chart that says of the um, Afghan population of Iran, only 3.9% um, only have a high school diploma and only 2% have a university degree. So there's definitely a lot of discrimination against Afghans also in terms of access to education and especially higher education. That's all I want to say for now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Frida. That, that leaves us um, less than 15 minutes to take up some uh, two or three questions from the chat. Um, uh, very good timing. So um, I'm going to mix two of the questions, and they are about the socialist character of the recent protests, like both the protest, the rebellion, and the labor movement. And also along with that, what is the actual state of socialist organizations in Iran? So what is the socialist character of the movement and if there are any socialist organization in Iran? Um, would anyone like to take up that question? Uh, since I just spoke, I think Kavir should go. Yeah, I just talked. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, so socialism is a spectrum, right? I mean, um, what exactly we mean is is different. I mean, I, I think I want to give a warning against um, equating, and I think this is done in the case of Iran quite so often because there is in, you know, in, in you know, whenever one hears that there's a, and you know, this is very much the case with uh, Iranian diaspora or Iranian middle class and all that, that whenever we hear of protests, we think, um, oh, this is a bad regime change, 
and you know it's a, it's a rejection of the Islamic Republic. Um, is that the case or not? It really depends, uh, you know, on 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 specific issues. But I, I think you know, as I tried to say, uh, it's important to realize that the popular protests and you know ex expressions of discontent have been a kind of integral part of the form of politics of Islamic Republic from the onset. I mean, this is how the revolution was won. So necessarily when we hear, when we see, you know, popular protests, that it doesn't mean that, you know, they're about regime change or that there's an imaginary about an alternative form of society. It, for me, disturbingly, uh, when I kind of get into conversations or you follow discussions and, you know, see, well, okay, what is these movements, you know, to the extent that there's some kind of an organized expression of a an alternative society, what is what is in their mind? Um, some kind of a, you know, solidaritarian uh, kind of non nation state, uh, you know, what I understand socialism to be is not part of the deal. You know, I mean, you know, if, if there is an, you know, very often it's about establishing a liberal market based uh, you know, Western oriented alternative, which, you know, many people be believe that, you know, it is, is the salvation because, you know, it's exactly the opposite in their minds of what Islamic Republic represents. So I think one of the things that we're kind of um, dealing with, and this has been one of the successful aspects of the Islamic Republic, is that it has, it has allowed a lot of expressions of discontent, but when it comes to organizing, political parties, networks, uh, organized ways of linking different kinds of discontent and coming up with alter alternative long-term mobilization to actually build the expertise, the networks, the, the personnel, the cadres to bring about political change, whether in a militant way or in a negotiated way. Islamic Republic has been really successful in demolishing these you know these these attempts to kind of network and create movements and political parties and so on and so forth so are there are there socialist movements by <laughs> Sorry, I, I I just got cut off. Yeah, I mean, are there socialist um, organizations and clusters and movements? Yes, there, there's a lot of them. Journals, uh, you know, like uh, uh, you know, organizations, but by and large, they're they're small and fragmented. And if they become more significant, they you know they are kind of repressed and they're targeted. So this is a long-term project. I think you know, kind of thinking about. Um, uh, you know, socialist alternatives. First, we have to say, all right, what kind of socialism are we talking about? Is it democratic? Is it inclusive? Um, for me, I mean, going back to what Fido was uh, was mentioning about ethnic um, mobilizations, I I find that truly disturbing. I mean, like, you know, like forms of federalism that are based on local elite ethnic, you know, ethnic elites and national elites. Uh, claiming separatism and establishing their own, you know, small polities to kind of implement the same kind of hierarchical and oligarchic models of uh, of domination in the name of national or, you know, autonomy or ethnic autonomy is not a solution. You know, democratizing the state as, you know, within within its framework is is the solution. But you need for for kind of these forms of mobilization to take place you need to have the ability to build long term you need a democratic space where you can bring you know you can you can foster debate you can mobilize people you can kind of establish political organizations and parties uh, to come up with platforms to convince people to build consensus to actually capture voices about what is needed where and because that is not present right now we're in this state of constant crisis uh, I am really reticent to kind of think that, you know, to kind of identify any kind of political protest as a post-Islamic Republic revolutionary alternative without thinking that, well, this, you know, 
exactly what happened with the 1979 revolution, that this can kind of throw us from the frying pan into the fire. We can get into a much worse Syrianized, Iraqized, uh, you know, situation where you have much more violence, civil war, and, uh, you know, and, and, and social destruction out of which nothing can come out, you know, except, except violence and, and further fragmentation. So I think this is a moment to kind of think that, you know, socialism is a long term prospect, but democratizing the state and democratizing the society and giving voice and institutionalizing these voices so that we know that, OK, what are these demands? What what are the claims? What you know, what are the voices and forces present and how can they work together? This is in the short and medium term. This is really the, the most important thing to kind of focus on. Thank you, Kaveh. Um, Danny, would you like to add something? Yeah, I I think Kaveh's point about the um, the protest, the cycle of protests that have been going on for decades, um, and the fact that protests in Iran are not always explicitly about um, overthrowing the regime or uh, replacing it, is a very important point. But I would I would like to ask Kaveh about. I mean, it is noteworthy, it seems to me, that in the last three years, the, um, there, had, there have been more and more slogans amongst the protesters that explicitly name the Islamic Republic as part of the problem. That was not the case 10 years ago. Uh, it was not really a, a little bit in the Green Movement towards the end and the sort of second, third phase of the Green Movement, 2010. But really, it seems that this is a trend, that more of the protesters are now saying, they're naming Khamenei, which is a red line. They're naming the Islamic Republic. They're using words like theocracy. We want the end of the regime. Um, and I'm wondering if you, th I mean, it seems that there is something, there's something to this, isn't there? Kaveh? I, I don't disagree. I mean, I think if you talk to, I, I, I'm in Chicago, so I'm, I'm always hesitant to kind of speak for others, especially if I'm, if I'm not in a place, if um, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, I, you know, I think if you talk to vast majority of Iranians, um, they would say that this regime is corrupt and, uh, and, you know, delegitimized. Uh, what is to replace it and how is another issue, right? So you can, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, I was politically active under the Shah as a teenager and, you know, went through the revolution. Um, one thing that one learns is that, um, you know, golden solutions um, do not exist. This is a messy process. And, you you know, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of Arantian in this way. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think violence is the, is, is the counterpoint to politics. It negates politics. And you have, you know, you, you increasingly have a militarized and securitized state uh, that, as you were saying, Danny, is engaging itself in these foreign wars. It has very little um, of even the residues of the claims to social justice and anti-imperialism that, you know, that maybe characterized it in, in the early days. Um, and I think there was a lot of that because, you know, this regime was like nothing to begin with. You know, it's like it mobilized people. It's, you know, uh, it attracted, it mobilized several million people who joined its rank and file. And it's those kids, those young people who just kind of joined to kind of build the rural areas, build rural roads and infrastructure and all that through local initiative, um, you know, that kind of like captured that, you know, like the, the moral claim part of the of the Islamic Republic in its early days. I mean, it was repressive. I, you know, I was on the losing side of that as a Marxist uh, secularist, you know, but nonetheless, I mean, you know, uh, you know, you, you have a, now you have a society that is, you know, that women are by and large literate in it. You know, as Frida was saying, it's under the Islamic Republic that 60% of, you know, three, four million university students are female, right? And it's those women who gained the right, who pushed within the confines of the state to kind of implement these changes and make themselves part of the, you know, like professional middle class. But then they're not professional middle class. They're not socialists. You know, they want the middle class 
professional life as engineers, as doctors, as nurses, as people with a diploma that want to have a condo and drive their cars and go to vacation in Switzerland or Turkey or somewhere. I mean, you know, those are universal demands of, of, of the middle class. They're not socialist demands, right? And a lot of that discontent is coming from the frustration of what this kind of development has brought about, but is unable to deliver now, right? So I think that this is a dead end, as we can see with the you know current climate crisis and environmental crisis and you know crisis of social justice worldwide. That this model of liberal middle class consumerist you know market oriented market based you know, modernization is not only a dead end, but it's a, it's what Marx referred to as barbarism. You know, it leads to social breakdown as we're seeing it on every day in the news. And it's, Iran is not very different in that regard, right? So because I take socialism seriously, I think, you know, okay, what is the, the general universal solidaritarian claims of the society? Where can this fragmented, diverse society with this rich political culture that has been built over the past long century, how can it rebuild itself? It needs to have some kind of an imaginary that says that, all right, being Iranian doesn't mean that you have to be Shia. Yeah, you can, you, every, everybody should be a citizen. Yeah, you know, whether you're Arab speaking or Turkish speaking, or if you're a woman or if you're a Baha'i, you should have equal political rights and social rights. And that has to be accepted. This is a long-term, you know, political struggle that needs to kind of be built, um, you know, through the press, through, you know, through education, through public debates. That space doesn't exist. You know, that space doesn't exist. It, it only erupts through political crises, you know, moments of political crisis or moments that you have, you know, elections in Iran. And that is a danger to me, you know, that in order to build a different, you know, long-term socialist program, a democratic socialist program in Iran, you need to kind of push to open the space to have these kinds of debates and this kind of mass grassroots mobilization. That space doesn't exist in present day Iran because it's going from crisis to crisis, right? And you do not have the organizational basis to actually build it. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. You know, all the ingredients are there, but that's what the struggle has to be about to actually push to say that, all right, you know, priority is, is the priority to create a different kind of public who pushes for these ideas or, a, a, you know, an illusion of a regime change that can bring about a military regime or a civil war, you know, or a U.S. invasion or, you know, an, an occupation. I mean, you know, what, what are the actual political alternatives to this regime? That's what really concerns me. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think we have to kind of think about seriously. Sorry, I went on too long. Um, thank you, Kava. And I think uh, that was a, that, that's a good uh, point to stop this conversation. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I would have loved to discuss this more. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for attending this meeting. Um, and we hope to see you in our future events, particularly the one in Afghan uh, about Afghanistan, considering the recent developments.